my metaphor for man and the environment uh, that I like to show just in terms of the cleanup after the oil spill was off a couple years back now. So another reason you might care. I like the other one because I'm an engineer. This is another reason it appeals to you. Uh, this is a slide I just added. This, you're the first guy seeing this slide, but I saw someone present this a couple weeks ago when I was at a seminar, Sustainable Leadership. And uh, if you think about, see this little sphere here sitting on the globe? That's if you took all this water, which looks like a lot of water, and you bundle it all up into a little ball. That's how much we have to work with. That's how much we've got clean water, period. And then if you take this thin atmosphere, we have a fairly thin atmosphere, actually, and put it into the ball, that's all we have. So it's actually a perspective when you start, and I'd love to have one of these for petroleum reserves as well. <laughs> I don't have that. Um, we don't have that much to work with. Okay, so it must be mess. So yeah. Does the water sphere include all of the ocean? Everything. It, it does. You said everything. I thought, I thought it was potable water. No, no, this is all water. All water. This wow. is the, that's why you look at the oceans, oh, that's lots of water, but it's really a thin skiff when you consider the size of the globe. Okay. So that's it. And then another way to think about it is in terms of atmospheric climate change. And so whether you believe in it or not, uh, things are changing. And if, whether you believe it or not, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere are going up every year. Every year, the CO2 level is going up. I wonder why that's happening. Oh, we're, we're also burning oil and gas. And there are people that are concerned that there's going to be a tipping point. And some people say that could be as soon as 2020. Uh, but things are changing now. So whether, whether it's the engineering side of not liking to see waste, environmental concerns about the environment directly are these longer term ones. I think there's always a reason. So we're at a fork in the road. And we need to decide on a different direction. So that's why we start talking about high performance buildings. That's why I can talk about net zero buildings. So trending towards net zero, there are things happening out there, and I don't know if you've talked about some of this stuff, David, but you know, energy codes are getting more stringent. And we have some pretty decent ones here in the state of Washington and, and more stringent still in Seattle. But you've got things that are heading in the direction of trying to require net zero in new buildings. So the state of California, Title 24 is there for energy code. They're targeting net zero in all their new buildings by 2020. And I'm not sure they figured out how that's going to happen yet, but that's what they're doing. Um, on the federal side, you have something called the Energy Independence and Security Act that came out in 2007 during the Bush years. And basically it's calling for a net zero building initiative for commercial buildings. And so that's what sprung this other thing. And so you're seeing lots of, on the federal side, you're seeing lots of activities moving in the direction of trying to go net zero. Has anyone heard of the, well, this is actually the Architecture 2030 Challenge you have? So you know that the 2030 Challenge is, is out there, and basically it's showing a rationing down of carbon use in new buildings or in existing buildings. We're targeting 2030 being the year where any new buildings at that point or existing buildings which have extensive renovations are going to be carbon neutral. Has anyone heard of the Living Building Challenge? A couple more hands, okay. So Living Building Challenge, which is part of the Cascadia Rebuilding Council, and now, and which is now called the International Living Future Institute because it's getting a lot of international exposure, uh, has a, a certification program for buildings, which is part of it, which says you will be net zero. And this is not net zero in theory. This is net zero proven at the meter after a year's operation. So if you want to get certified as a living building, you're net zero energy. So I think you saw these definitions maybe last week. Yeah, this, this actually yesterday. Yes, yesterday. So I don't have to say a lot about it, except, except um, that when you do a net zero energy project that I've seen in the building sector, people actually building buildings are trying to be net zero, they're usually going after the first definition, which is at the meter, the energy use that you generate in a year has to pull out net zero for what you produce versus what you pull off the utility grids, whether that be the electric utility or the gas, whatever it is. So you can get into this question of source energy, that gets more complicated, as David probably told you. You can talk about the utility cost, but the utilities don't always cooperate. And from the emissions side, it gets very complicated. So this is the one that people are easily, most easily able to grab onto. So it's at the meter, at the building. So here's a by definition net zero building. It's off the grid. So if you don't want to connect to the utilities, um, and you're not importing, importing fuel, you know, propane or something like that, and you just want to put TV on the roof or something, you're net zero. So otherwise, uh, there aren't too many buildings doing that. But some parts of the world you have to be off the grid because there's no grid to connect to. Uh, there is a big grid to connect to, and in that case, and I don't know if you talked about this concept, Dave, as well, uh, the utilities require are required by law, though they're a little bit ornery about it, to let you do something called net metering. And that is the idea where you can let your excess power, if you're generating renewable energy, let's say with PV, 
go back onto the grid during the summertime and you may not need as much, and, and they're going to compensate you for that. So there's actually a way to do it. But there are some utilities that are, that are a little bit annoyed with this. Uh, they're worried that all these different renewable sources out on the grid may produce power that is not, it's not the right kind of power for them. It may cause problems on the overall grid. Okay, so the process. This is, this is my high, our high performance building process, but it's also the net zero energy building process as well. And you'll see variations on this out there, but this is sort of how I summarize it. Uh, it starts with owner commitment. If you don't have an owner that's interested in trying to pursue a high performance building goal or net zero, you're obviously not gonna get anywhere with it. It requires a very integrated process with the team, and the owner has to be part of that team. And so if you, if you were going into a new project and the owner came to you and said, ah, oh, you know, it sounds good, I wanna be net zero, First off, you gotta make sure they're educated and understand what that means, and then make sure they're still committed once they get that. Um, so highly integrated team, oh, excuse me, so from the owner perspective, uh, you wanna make sure they're very clear on their performance goals. So, you know, the minimal right now, unless they're lawbreakers, is the energy code compliant. Uh, there's other certifications out there, LEED, if people play with LEED. Uh, if you go for a LEED building and you wanna hit a certain level of performance, let's say it's you know, lead certification, lead silver, lead gold, lead platinum. If you go for gold, you pretty much have to do something on the energy side that's more than code to make that happen. But you're not actually proving it with performance after the fact. All you're doing is saying that relative to a, a baseline building, which is an ASH rate 90.1, is that 90.1 energy standard model, uh, this much better. But that doesn't actually say how well the building's working. If you're, if you're doing a, a living building, you're actually having to prove that performance, or an energy neutral building, it actually hopefully shows you something. So this is sort of a ratcheting down. And that 2030 challenge we talked about before, I'd be one more step, and then we're down here. So that's, the owner has to understand that and, and be on board with that. And then sort of the overall, one way of looking at how to get there, you know, if you talk about a typical building, and a lead gold or platinum building, and then something net zero capable, um, do you guys know what an EY is? Is that a term, amount, a term you've heard as well, which is kilo BTUs per square foot per year? And so that's one metric that you can look at for how your building's performing relative to another similar building to it, is how many thousands of BTUs per square foot per year does your building consume when you consider electricity, gas, anything that plugs into it that provides energy relative to another building. And so there's, there's information on typical buildings out there. You know, you want to be a little bit better. So good design and do things to reduce the loads. Good behavior, we're gonna talk about occupants because you can't, you can design a net zero energy building but if your occupants aren't on board and it's gonna happen, how you engage that, that side of it, so it's the owner and the occupants. And then there's actually some policy that needs to happen too, I think, because uh, without incentives, it's really hard to convince someone to spend the money to put in, let's say, all the renewables you might need. So this is a quick encapsulation of how it looks. Hey, hey Tom, can yeah. you back up? Yeah. Can, can somebody uh, explain this on what we did last quarter? Uh, maybe Diane or John. Sure. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> how about you both do it? Um, <laughs> Well, uh, and you know, you're talking about related. Yeah, exactly. like we did a lot, man. <laughs> related, re related to this. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, the one class um, with you last quarter was actually going through the process of redesigning the systems, making the little adjustments to um, basically get the fifty percent. We, we, we so started we did that. Yeah. Yeah. on our building. Yeah. And you our, started implementing yeah. measures to try to bring it down. Yeah, we we pretended like it was retro. Right. Okay. So, so the first thing we did was we ran a model. Right. Okay. Saying, yeah. We baseline, baseline model. Baseline model. Where you stand right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and then what did we do? Uh, then we made some. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, um, well, we found out that um, a lot of the things that we thought would be uh, really reduce it, like doing things to the envelope, really did compare to things that we did inside, like uh, no air conditioning. No air conditioning systems. There's a lot yeah. of what I'll call low hanging fruit, and maybe that's what you guys learned that you can go after in the existing buildings. Uh, to make a big difference. And so that's actually an important part of the process, which it sounds like you've already done, and we'll, we'll sort of touch on again, is, is knowing where the big the big chunks of the energy are being used and, and what can affect them. And so you sort of go after those first. So it's, if you're going to prioritize a high performance building, go after those things first. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get sorry, to that. I'm sorry. That's all right. No, that's okay. Uh, so an integrated team. So right now, the way buildings have traditionally been designed for forever, uh, except when you go back to when there was the master builders in the days of yore. Uh, is you'll have an architect or an owner who calls an architect up and says, I would like a building that does this, this, and this for me. 
the architect will draw, make some drawings, design that building. Our owner will say, yeah, that's pretty good. We better get some engineers and some people on board now. So they come over and they take this set of plans and they throw them over the wall to an engineer like myself and say, put ducts in there and, and pipes in there that'll keep me comfortable, you know, keep the building space comfortable and all these things. And they've kind of defeated the process of going after high performance because they haven't really thought about those things, thought about what they're building in advance. They haven't thought about how you site the building, maybe how you orient it. What are things you can do? And so an integrated approach brings the team and the stakeholders all together in a different way of delivery than the traditional model. So it's not a linear process, it's more of an iterative process. Hi. So to illustrate that, uh, this is the old, the old model where you've got basically the architect up here the, designing a building, and that from that there's going to be loads. And so loads for an HVAC engineer like myself mean heating and cooling requirements. And so those loads are going to come out of you know, the, the climate, the building design, how the building is used, occupied, the program and the function of the building. And so what they'll do is they'll do these drawings, they'll throw them down to me and, and, and David, maybe in his, in his day, uh, and we'll select and size the building systems, and we need it to be energy code compliant. So there you go. That's the way we used to do it. So this would be more approach looking more integrated approach. So here are the architect, we call architecture, integrated architectural building services design. And so this is a more iterative thing. So we're looking at all these things and getting feedback from the fourth standpoint of performance and other, and actually not only just energy performance. It could be other things as well. It could be the environmental quality of the space. It could be natural light. That's an important parameter. You know, lots of things that people might think are important that relate to more sustainable goals. And so you're going, in this case, after passive and low energy design alternatives. Those can be factored into a process where you're doing investigations early, you're doing some analysis early, you're getting feedback to the architects. They're going back and doing some things. And you hopefully then come up with something that maybe meets the 2030 challenge, but certainly going to be a lot better than code. Part of which is load reduction and part of which is system efficiency. You know, we talk about those things. So Z hole. Um, it is it is going to be a case study that sort of peppers its way through this presentation. Uh, but I'll just keep coming back to it as I'm going along. This is a little bit about it. It was completed last year. Did anyone did you take a tour by chance? You did. Okay, so you you actually maybe you want to <laughs> No, all right, I'll, I'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, it's a project that I, I got the pleasure of working on, and, uh, with, and it had a, a whole group of players uh, with me, including the city of Issaquah. In fact, the city of Issaquah were, the, were one of the brainchilders were saying we want to do this project, we want to do it in Issaquah. So hats off to them. Uh, Built Green is a, is a home uh, sustainable building certification program. King County. Uh, Port Blakely is the people that are developing Issaquah Highlands. We had PSE, the Puget Sound Energy, WSU, uh, the architect. So a whole cast of players behind this, including, including me. I, didn't, I was with a couple different firms, so I didn't put my name up there. Um, and it's basically the objective was to come up with some mid-range, in terms of cost, market affordable uh, buildings that could be replicable and also would be net zero. And so it was kind of interesting because they said, well, we need to hire someone like me to help them figure out how to do those. Of course, I'm too expensive for a market rate condo project or townhouse project. But we're doing it as a one-off and hopefully trying to find a way to demonstrate a way that it can be done on a replicable basis. So some of the goals on the project were net zero energy. So that was actually the was actually written into the contract for the developer they brought on board and for the architect. You will be net zero. And so that was that changes things. And all of a sudden that's what you shall do. It's no longer kind of, oh let's just see if we can make it happen. It's it's part and parcel with how you're going about the process. So it actually helps drive the process in some ways. So they had net zero carbon as well, some water reduction goals, uh, and some other things. Now this came out prior to the living building challenge came out, coming out. We might have adopted that as, as our sort of approach to this project because we were then, but it wasn't there. So we kind of came up with these goals on our own. Uh, if you're interested in looking at it, by the way, it's z-home.org. The word that's about it. Uh, so now, for that context, I'm going to keep going. So when I talk about low energy projects or high performance projects, the cheapest way to reduce the energy requirements is to reduce the requirements for energy in the project. So load reduction. So what's an example of load reduction strategy? Does anyone just want to throw one out there? Yeah. Lighting retrofit. What's that? Lighting retrofit. A lighting retrofit, right. So you can put more efficient lighting in and require less output lights. So that's one option. Anyone got another one? Yeah. Or installation. That's 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 the, the kind of 
kind of the obvious and easy one, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, you can do things to reduce the need to heat the space because you've got a better envelope to start with. You know, that's a load reduction strategy. Less heating equipment, less required for heating. Yes, more efficient equipment to do the heating pool. Well, that, that is going to be this here. Oh, okay. So I like to think of it as load reduction required the requirements to provide light. Reduce the requirements for lighting, reduce the requirements for heating and cooling, those kinds of things first. Then you get into what I call passive strategies. Then you get to the moving parts. So that's yeah. I mean, I, you, you're right on the you're right on the money. I just want to work, work through it first. But it's cheaper to reduce load a lot of times than it is to put in more fancy systems. So I like to think of it in this order. Sometimes I mean it's a bit intricate when you actually get into it, but but that's how I go. So for the Sea Home project, uh, you start thinking about energy in terms of bar charts and pie charts. And so here's a here's a pie chart. That we looked at early for you know what's a typical home around here possibly you know a, a typical good project a good a good building a code building used in terms of the breakdown of the different energy uses and so this kind of shows it you know 15,000 kilowatt hours and that's converting electrical and gas all to kilowatts that's common energy unit saying all right so a typical two bedroom townhouse in the Issaquah Highlands might be about 15,000 kilowatt hours I mean it could be a range around that, but this was sort of us looking at it, saying, "All right, so 50,000 kilowatt hours, and what does that, you know, what does that mean?" So what it means if you if you thou shalt be net zero energy is an awful lot of PV on the roof. Okay, um, so this is the early rendering of when PV was a little less efficient than it is today, and you can see we're already like off the sides of the roof. Uh, we would need to have three times as much PV on the roof of one of these townhouses to achieve net zero if that's how efficient we are. So it's, the, the incentives are cost, because PV is very, very expensive relative to most of anything else you can do to make your house a good house or your building a good building. And then real estate, you just don't have enough physical real estate to do it. So if you, and I'm gonna jump ahead and I'll come back to this. So if you think about buildings like this building, you know, what's your real estate for PV? Well, if you can, if you can break the boundaries of the project and go out and put PV on the uh, parking garage across the way there, then you, then you might have a chance at it. But if you're saying, my project has this perimeter, it's the building perimeter, I have to be net zero. When you start to think about renewable energy, it's like, well, I got the roof, if I'm gonna put PV, and what else have I got? And so load reduction becomes very expensive, very important, and getting the most efficiency you can becomes very important. So the Z Home project, to put it in context, at the time, uh, one square foot of PV produces about 10 watts, and also about 10 kilowatt hours per year of annual energy production if you have good solar access for your PV. And the cost of a watt then was about $7 a watt uh, installed capacity. And so we did the math and we said if we have a 15,000 watt or 15,000 kilowatt hour